It's a car that launched the golden age of Chevrolet. 1955 was the first of a three-year series of cars known as Tri-5s. And today, Horsepower's got an original for a unique Tri-5 transformation. This one is a Bel Air two-door post car, and well, like many over the years, the original 265 got replaced. In this case, a blown 454 big block, making about 700 horsepower. Problem is, the factory frame was never intended to handle that much power. And we've got the cracks to prove it. And this is common in overpowered Tri-5 frames. When you put a load on the car, you can actually see the crack get bigger. And who knows, if you stand on it long enough, you might even end up passing that big block in the blower. What we're going to do is give this classic bow tie all the benefits of contemporary framework, performance, and power while keeping the same looks that changed Chevrolet's history. It was the midpoint of the fabulous 50s. Marilyn Monroe was the country's hottest bombshell. Disney's new theme park, the hottest place to take a vacation. They were fast changing times. Reflected in everything from youthful, radical, new music to GM's radical new Chevy for 1955. What's new? Everything. The new Motoramic Chevrolet is new from the ground up. Its so-called Motoramic styling changed the car's image from basically boring to fun and exciting. It was a whole new car and suddenly cool to drive a Chevy. New from the ground up. GM spent a trunkload of cash spreading the word about its all new hot one for 55, like this commercial featuring a slick haired newscaster. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Robert Trout bringing you some great news for 1955. Of course, part of the story was Chevy's history making 265 V8, all 162 horsepower. 180 with a $59 power pack option. Are you all ready? The ad guys went all out to prove the new Chevy could beat the competition. The gal in this spot is proving how well the power steering works with her own version of tow-in. They pulled out all stops and even pulled a skier in this ad to prove, well, probably nothing. There was a new wider chassis used for 55 through 57 models. One reason for the name Tri-5s. More about that later. Today, all Tri-5s are revered for their timeless personality and appeal. Whether they're stock or chopped and stuffed with blowers and big blocks, or even modified for drag racing. Yeah, the legend lives on thanks to GM's legendary launch of a history-changing car, the one and only Motoramic Chevrolet of 1955. More than a new car, a new concept of low-cost motoring. Take a look at what's in store for the Bel Air. It's a 580 cubic inch big block Chevy that's gonna be outfitted with twin 76 millimeter Turbonetics turbos. Now, how much horsepower do you ask? Well, enough to twist that stock frame like a pretzel. So to give our 55 shoebox a stout foundation, we paid a visit to a little company with a big reputation for producing some of the best Tri-5 chassis in the world. It's here in the quiet little town of Grand, Alabama. A family fabrication business that opened its doors back in 1979. This is where old world craftsmanship meets new age technology to turn out everything from turnkey hot rods like this 38 Chevy to Tri-5 foundations like the one we're going to use for our project. The way we look at it, it's like building a house. That's your foundation that you're starting with. There's still a lot of work to be done after you get the foundation laid. But if you don't start with a good foundation, then you're going to have problems down the road. What we're going to do, we're going to take our chassis platform, we're going to start at a, at a, a ground line, and then we're going to set a ride height. Then we'll go in and drop a, a body drawing on it just to kind of give him the feel of, of where that car is going to sit and what it's going to look like. Then we will go in and, and build all of our stands, uh, build our cross member and all of our bracketry, and then we can actually take that and convert it into a cut path. The Plasma Cam CNC laser cutter is a fairly new addition to the facility, adding speed and total precision to the chassis building process. It sounds like a lot of work and it is, 
but once you get it to that cut path, it's virtually ready to go. It makes you wonder how you got by without that thing. I don't even want to imagine it. We have nightmares about what would happen if it went down. Meanwhile, on the main shop floor, several chassis projects are in the works following the specs from CAD program. Needless to say, there's more than one way to build a chassis and the more traditional ways to take a piece of two by four square tubing like this, mandrel bend it, and you're done. Now here, after the various plates are sculpted and back welded, inner supports are added every 10 inches or so before the top plate goes on. Now that's gonna last. It's a longer process for us, but we're more about building a better looking and a stronger piece than we are about just turning out more product. So after all the pieces are cut, we just start assembling them in the, in the jigs and uh, uh, put it all together. And when, it, uh, when it's all pulled out, it's basically ready to go. Next up, the powder coater. And thanks to Chris's team, our 55 will have a foundation fit for adding new muscle to a classic old Tri-5. To take something from nothing and take it from a concept to a complete finished product, uh, that makes me happier than anything. Well, here it is back from the powder coater, complete with all that bracketry, plus holes in the frame for the exhaust. Man, no wonder those guys are so proud of their work. Now we got to get it from here to under there. That's what we do after the break. No need to get your frame off the couch. Horse Power's back to take a modified Tri-5 and modify it even more with a 580 cubic inch big block with twin turbos that'll sit on a custom built foundation in place of the stock chassis. So how do we make that happen? The only way you can by separating the body from the original chassis. Now 55 frame off's got to start somewhere. We're going to start by removing the front clip. First, the front bumper's got to come off. The radiator comes out. And after removing several bolts underneath and on top, with a little finesse, the front clip comes loose. Oh, it's not so heavy. No, it's not bad at all. Now on to the rest of the body, which involves separating everything from it and the engine like this brake booster assembly. Then more body mount bolts. And in a situation like this, expect the unexpected. Back here, someone blocked our access to one of the bolts with a piece of sheet metal for some reason. So I'm going to saw a hole through it. A couple of the bolts are running into the floorboard, so we're just gonna cut them off to free them from the frame. And here's a good example of stock body flex. Unbolted, the weight of the engine pulls the frame a half inch away from the firewall. Well, here's another example. Notice the movement when we take the weight off the frame by lowering the lift. We're placing the lift extenders directly under the body's pinch wells where it has the most strength. Here we go. And after the body clears the back wheels, the chassis is ready to roll out. Now that we got the body separated, we're able to see a couple more things that could end up to be big problems if the car was still driven this way. This mid-engine mount is supposed to be flat and upright, but the amount of power this engine makes has got it bent forward and down. And that only leads to other things, like the clutch linkage. It's pushed forward and makes contact with the header. Hey, if you had a cross member like somebody did here, please weld or at least bolt it in place. Now let's remove that big block, blower, and trans from the factory frame for a little comparison. Without the added on cross member, the factory frame has no inner support. Our street rod garage upgrade has twin J legs welded to it for all the support you would ever need. Up front, despite the factory engine cradle's mass, it's far weaker than the sleek setup of our replacement. Hey, look at what we got to make our chassis a full roller. It's all good stuff, including a Curry 9-inch rear end from Flaming River, this manual rack and pinion setup. Now, Street Rod Garage custom-made all of our suspension components, including the front and rear sway bars, the upper lower control arms to mention a couple. For shocks, well, coilovers from Bill Stein and bare brakes, including slotted rotors and six piston calipers front and back, plus these Mustang II type spindles. One more comparison before we get to work. The stock upper control arm is a lot more massive than the upgrade and a lot heavier. Plus this one's got all kinds of adjustability. Downstairs, same story. 
The lower arm's the first to go on using a through bolt. Then with a jack stand for support, we need to make sure it's level for the spindle, which goes in place next, followed by this bump stop. Now the upper control arm goes in place and attaches to the spindle. Then we snug everything down and add cotter pins. Before moving on, we need to check for perfect 90 degrees vertically. And the level indicates the bottom needs to come out a bit. Now this is where the adjustable ends come into play. Next, we can install a pair of cushion blocks to our chassis for the Flaming River manual rack and pinion system. This thing's made of cast aluminum and only weighs 15 pounds and installs with a heim joint to each spindle. The front sway bar has its own mounting place too and it installs with four bolts. It also comes with these split rings designed to prevent lateral movement. The sway bar also connects to the lower control arm using links with spherical ends. After mounting the caliper brackets, the bare 13 inch rotors go on with just a couple of nuts for now so that we can check the toe. We use a pair of tape measures to square up the rotors, in this case 55 inches on each side. Then by giving this tie rod end a few turns, we give it an eighth inch of toe in, which is ideal for this setup. With that handle, we can install our coil over shocks, first bolting the top to the chassis, then using a pair of spacers, the bottom bolts to the lower control arm. Well, next we're gonna install this Curry Track 9 rear end and notice how Street Rod Garage made these brackets with their plasma cam and welded them in place before the powder coater. Now, we're leaving this thing empty for now, which will make hanging it to the chassis a whole lot easier. This is the first bar of our triangulated four link system. And with this design, you don't need to run a centering device like a pan hard bar. So how do you know what length to set these things? Well, if you're nice to your chassis builder, he'll give you all those specs, then get you one of these radius rod setup bars. It'll put you right on the money. Now you can loosely bolt in the two shorter lengths and the rear sway bar. After we get through cinching down this sway bar in four lengths, well, we can fill the center section, throw in some axles, and well, the chassis project keeps rolling on. After the break, that is. Welcome back to Horsepower's Tri-5 Transformation. We just removed the body from a 55 Bel Air to swap its weak stock chassis with one we just had custom made at Street Rod Garage. Then we got busy, building it up with lower and upper control arms, a Mustang II spindle, and a Flaming River manual rack and pinion system. After bolting up a front sway bar and bare brake rotors, we set the toe in and installed front Bilstein coilover shocks. Then out back, we bolted up an empty Curry rear end housing and moved on to a four link triangulated suspension and rear sway bar. We're filling it up with an Eaton Detroit locker and a 350 ring gear. Now what this is gonna do is give us great strength for that big block we're putting in here and it'll be great for cruising down the highway. The rear set of coilovers can bolt up to the chassis next. Then we drop bare emergency brakes onto the curry axles. And after sliding the axles into place, put on the backing plates and bolt everything down. Next, it's the caliper brackets, the rotors, and the rear brake calipers and we can finish the entire new brake setup with the front calipers. To feed our twin turbo big block Chevy, we're gonna start the fuel system out with this 22 gallon stainless steel tank from Rick's Hot Rod Shop. Now they did an awesome job by filling the insides with a welding pump and filter. The pump is Weldon's 1100A, which is rated at 1100 horsepower. It flows up to 135 gallons per hour. It's super quiet and draws a low amperage. And here's how everything's routed. Fuel comes into the tank from the return line and gets held in this sump. From there, it's picked up, goes through the filter, into the pump, and the pump pressurizes it up to the fuel rail and regulator. Now, the reason the sump is here is to keep fuel concentrated in that area. That way, the pump will never go dry unless you run the tank out. This thing looks like a work of art. It's almost a shame to cover it with a body. For a custom chassis with all the top shelf stuff like this, you're going to lay down some major cash. Oh, did we mention this is not a budget build? Hey, it's fun to fantasize sometimes though. And to make a true roller out of it, it's gotta have wheels and tires, and we'll use these while we're making up our mind on what to order. Time now to drop in this big 580 big block, which is gonna rest down here on the frame. 
thanks to these adjustable mounts we got with our chassis that also have urethane isolators in them. All right, easy, slow, stop. Just for mock-up purposes, we're mounting the transmission, a TCI 4L80E six-speed automatic. It's versatile enough to fit Chevy small blocks, big blocks, and LS engines, and it comes with a lifetime guarantee. We're getting close, but before we mate the body to the chassis, we have some work to do in the trunk. Now the big recess for the spare tire would interfere with the new fuel tank, so we're drilling all around the opening and eventually the well comes right out. Now the stock tank has to come right out too. Then after cutting a metal plate, tweaking it just a bit, we can tack it in place and add some seam sealer. Ready? Mush, come on. Now we can roll the chassis under the body. All right, about right there. All right. I'm gonna come down, everybody clear? Yep. Are we looking? Okay. And back. And with new mounts from Prothane installed, the body can come to rest on its new foundation. I did it. All right, come on, let's go. Then the front clip goes back on. Just wanna lay it in right yep. there, yeah. start your bolt. So what's next for the Tri-5? Well, a trip to another shop to fab up some special tubing for the turbos, then back here for a bunch more mods, and we'll eventually christen it on the dyno jet. But hey, that's a whole other show. We got more of this one coming up. Stay with us. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. You know what the sun and road debris do to your headlight lenses? They get discolored, oxidized, and pitted. Instead of spending a wad of cash for replacements, you can actually restore them yourself with the help of this mother's Powerball for Lights headlight restoration kit. After masking and cleaning the surface, use a variable speed drill, the Powerball, and plastic polish. Run the drill at a slow speed, polishing the lens with a back and forth motion. When the entire lens is clean and clear, buff it with the supplied microfiber towel. The difference is pretty impressive. Now if you still have pitting or discoloration, these severe duty pads from the kit should do the trick. Now either way, it's going to improve the looks of the car and it's going to improve your ability to see and be seen at night. And that's clearly a safety factor out on the road. Now these kits are running about 25 bucks at your local parts store. That's it for this week's Horsepower. We'll see you next time.